a seemingly impossible murder of a prepared woman in a high security apartment. But the question remains, who killed Inga Lotz? A boyfriend was suspected, arrested, tried and acquitted, but did he get away with murder? Why did private investigators uncover strange letters and emails many years later of a secret brotherhood among her friends? Did they know the truth about what happened that night? Because someone does and no one is talking. You are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna, but today's case is quite a confusing, puzzling, just overall, it is a lot to uncover and there are many different theories, there are many different suspects, but overall no one really truly knows even though many do have very strong opinions. Now I did have a website that I used a lot for the source. They had a lot of information and this was Truth For Inga and they do have the website that I will link down below for you. They are quite biased in their opinions of what occurred, but if you want to look deeper into the case, you can go there and kind of research more yourself. But I did try to compile as many different theories and suspects and information as I could get my hands on from many different sources. So I hope to bring you a rounded version of this case and let you make your own decision as to what you believe occurred. Because at the end of the day, this young woman was brutally murdered and nobody knows what happened. So it was actually 2005 in South Africa and Inga Lotz lived in Stellenbosch. She was born to Jan and Juanita Lotz. Jan was a radiology professor and Juanita was a physiotherapist before staying home with Inga once she was born. They actually tried for 10 years to get pregnant with her and she was their only child because they felt like she was perfect. They didn't need somebody else in their life. They were obsessed with her in the sweetest way and she was just their precious Inga. They were a super wealthy family. They gave Inga the best and she loved her parents just as much. She didn't even see them as overbearing. She called her mother every single morning to let her know that she was awake for class and she was safe. On the weekends, she would go home to see her parents and she was always bringing her mother flowers and they were all actually devoted Christians who went to the church, His People Church, so they would often do that together as well. At this time though, Inga was 22 years old and she she was attending the University of Stellenbosch. She was studying for her master's in mathematical statistics. Inga was incredibly smart. In fact, she scored the fourth highest matrix marks in the Western Cape. Now, Inga was not only book smart, but she was also street smart as well. She lived in one of the highest security apartments at 21 Shiraz. And Inga had even waited to move in until they had gotten their gate that you needed a remote to get through to make sure that there was no strange individuals around this complex. She waited for that to be built and set up before she ever even got inside her apartment. She was very vigilant and it was something that in South Africa, unfortunately, especially, they have to be very, very cautious as women because there is a ton of violence against women there. She not only had the gate, there was an electric wire at the top of the fence and there was also bars on her windows that made her feel comfortable there. And Inga was really known to be this amazing girl with tremendous potential and lots of love. So why did this horrific thing have to happen to her? So on March 16th, a 911 call would be placed from her apartment. Now the man on the line said he was also a resident, but that a resident had possibly committed suicide. Now the man said that he didn't actually find this woman, that it was another person that claimed to be her friend or knew her, and that he had come running back to this resident to tell him to call 911. Now this friend of Inga was named Christo Pretorius and he claimed that he lived pretty close nearby and that he was actually asked by a friend of his around 10.30 p.m. that night to check on a girl 
who was named Inga. He did not actually, Christo did not actually know Inga, but his friend did. And so his friend told him, Inga is actually prone to fainting. She has this illness and we can't get a hold of her. We live so far away. We cannot get to her. Would you please go check on her instead? And so Christo was already in bed with his wife, but he decided to get up and just to help his friends out. So Around 10.35 p.m., he headed over to her apartment complex, and because there was that gate that was there, he had to click the buzzer to try to get her attention, to get her to let him in. He was buzzing for apartment 21, and he pressed three times. She was not answering any of these times, and that's when he saw a resident of the apartment complex out on their balcony. And so he said, can you please let me in? I'm trying to go check on this girl for my friends. And this resident actually let him in. Once he got inside, he went to her apartment door and began to knock there. However, she was still not answering. He could not hear anything inside. And that is when he looked through the window, and he saw that the lights were off. It was completely dark in there because it already was nighttime but there was a faint glow from the tv that was on in the living room and that's when he tried to push his way in and found that the door was actually unlocked so it did not take much effort but what he would find inside would be the most gruesome scene that even the most seasoned officers would recoil at now, Christo walked only a few steps before finding Inga, and he called her name, but she didn't answer, and that's when he found her lying on the sofa with her legs crossed, and her head appeared to be covered in these dark patches, but it was dark in the room. He couldn't really tell what it was. He believed that she might have a neck wound, and also that she was holding a knife. Now, he didn't look for very long. He realized what he was looking at, that she was not alive, and he quickly removed himself from the apartment, and he went to go get help. So when officers arrived, the door had been reshut from Krista when he left. The lights were still off inside of the apartment, and they quickly found what Christo had explained, but he was a bit off, and they chalked this up to him being in shock. Now, the knife he had seen in Inga's hand was actually a remote control for the TV that was on in front of her. It made sense, but in the dark, it could have appeared to be a knife, especially if his mind went to this being a suicide. Now, Captain May Franz September was the first on the scene, and he claimed he was the one who went in, he turned the lights on, and he was going to examine the body, and that he also believed he moved the coffee table at this time to get a picture of Inga and you know, the full capacity, and that is when another captain, Captain Burtis Prince, checked the perimeter of the complex for any suspicious individuals, as well as any evidence, because they were wondering if there was possibly a weapon that had been discarded, because there was not one inside the home that they had found yet. They were pretty quickly realizing this wasn't a suicide, and the apartment was neat. There was no ransacking that appeared to have occurred, so this wasn't a robbery gone wrong. Nothing of value had been stolen However, her gate remote control was missing, as well as a knife from her kitchen. There was also a bloody towel lying on the floor in the bathroom, as well as this bloody smudge that was next to it that looked like it could be a partial shoe print. Now, the autopsy revealed that it was way worse than Christo even could have imagined because Inga was struck on the back of the head about 13 times with a, with a blunt object and she had also been stabbed in the neck and the chest around 20 times. Her chest appeared to have an attempt to carve it open and it was theorized that the attacker was someone she knew well who attacked her from behind while she was on her couch with some sort of hammer. This was deemed overkill and indescribable viciousness. Now, this bloody towel wasn't actually soaked in blood. It almost appeared as though the item, the possible murder weapon, had been wiped on it to remove the blood and then just thrown on the floor. Now, like I said, the item suspected was 
a hammer and they were unable to locate it anywhere in or around this complex to confirm exactly what type of hammer this was. And the blood marks on the tile floor were actually two different marks right next to each other. Now, of course, investigators were asking Christo a lot of questions and Christo admitted that the friend that had called him to see if he would go over and check on Inga was a man named Marius Botha. Now, Christo and Marius were only church friends and like I said, Christo did not know Inga. So he had seen her a few times through church when Inga would go to Marius's church, which was also Christo's church, and they would see each other then, but they were more like acquaintances. So he was only doing this as a favor, and Marius had told him that he and his friends had been trying to get a hold of Inga that day since 3 p.m., but they lived quite far away. And so for the last seven hours, they were trying to get a hold of her. She was not answering her phone, and so that's when they asked Christo. From phone records, police found that after finding Inga and having that other person call 911, Christo actually called three different people. Now, this was said to be Marius to inform him of what he had found. He also called his pastor and his brother, Philip, around 10.45 p.m. that night. Now, another call was actually found on the record that was made between Christo and Marius about nine minutes before Christo called him, his pastor, and his brother. Now, this was actually a call that would have been exactly a minute before Christo said he arrived at the apartment, and Christo said he didn't know exactly what he said, but he believed that it was just Marius asking if he had found the apartment. But investigators began looking more into what Inga had done that day, exactly where she had been, who she had been with, and they found that the morning of her murder, a contractor had knocked on her door to fix a tile that her movers had actually broken when they were putting in her couch because she hadn't been there long, and so she had just gotten her brand new couch to put in, so they broke this tile. She had called to get someone to come and fix it, and she was actually on her way out the door to go to class during this time. So she asked the contractor, can you come back later? It's not a great time, and she headed out for the day. But after she went to school, she came back to her apartment because she wanted to get the tile fixed, and the last people to see Inga alive were believed to be the construction workers, the contractors at her apartment, and they were said to be with Quick Con Construction, which is a strange name, but since this was a new building, there were still some apartments being fixed up, and so they were there doing some work. The contractor came back to fix the tile for her, and Juanita, her mother, said that the entire time these men were over, Inga was on the phone with her. She knew how to be safe. She wanted someone to be there in case something happened, so she was on the phone the entire time until Juanita heard Inga leading the men out and locking the door behind her, and then they said goodbye. Now, these men were searched for to be questioned further, and investigators found that they were actually gone. You see, they had only been temporary employees of this company, and the company had been liquidated. So they had all moved back to Mozambique. But investigators found that there was actually an interaction between her going to school and her coming home. And this was with one of her close friends that she had lunch with at 1 p.m. And we'll get into that a little bit later, but she had rushed home to make sure that this tile could be fixed before she actually decided to leave again. Now, this time she had gone to the Simons Trust shopping center around 2.55 the day of her murder. She had bought a cheeseburger, an energy drink, a copy of Shape magazine, and these were all at different stops. Her last stop, however, was at 3.07 p.m. at the DVD place, and she had rented the Stepford Wives. This was found in her apartment, and the DVD was actually in the player. It was playing on the TV, like, you know, Krista had said he had found it playing and the DVD case was just lying on the table. So they actually brought that in for testing and they had found that while this was a high security complex, the security had actually been compromised that day with the power being shut off for hours while maintenance installed a fan. All the while, construction workers, the contractors were on this property and knew that Inga was there and that she lived alone. So this added even more 
suspects, different people that they really couldn't get a hold of. They didn't know exactly who they were, but they knew that they could have been involved. Inga's mother, Juanita. She told investigators that she had actually learned about her daughter's murder, not from them, but from Marius, the one who called Christo, who called her at 10.52 p.m., about 20 minutes after he had heard the news and told her that they had bad news. He then came to her house to tell her what happened. But he actually wasn't alone. He was with his friend and roommate who was 22-year-old Fred Vanderveyer. And this is when investigators began to learn about Marius and Fred and how they were the ones trying to get hold of Inga that day. That they were the ones searching for her and couldn't get a hold of her. And Fred actually had more of a connection to Inga than Marius did. Even though Marius and Inga were friends, Fred Vanderveyer was Inga's long-term boyfriend. They were actually in a relationship for about a year at this point. Inga's parents loved him. His parents loved her. They had all thought that they had found the perfect life partners for each other. Fred had even spoken to Inga's parents about a possible engagement for the next year. Just before the funeral of Inga, Juanita actually texted Fred and said, Thank you for all your love, Fred. The rest of us for one year. Our hearts have been broken by our angel child. Love you. Sleep well. Now, he was actually invited to speak at Inga's funeral, and he said, To see a world in a grain of sand, and a heaven in a wildflower. Hold infinity in the palm of your hand, and eternity in an hour. Jana Juanita, you raised Ing as a child of God, and that is who she was to me. I just want to say one word who Inga was to me. She was Jesus. And if there is one thing she did for me was to show Jesus to me and bring me closer to him. She did what she had to do. It was enough. Fred had actually moved into the Lotes family home to comfort Inga's parents after she had passed. But then everything changed. You see, Fred would become one of the top suspects, and Inga's father, Jan, would become very vocal that he actually never really trusted Fred. He felt that Fred was manipulative and controlling, and in fact, when they were said to be going to identify Inga's body, they were actually going to send Juanita's brother because they couldn't do it. And so when his brother got there and found that Fred had actually asked two pastors to identify her body instead of the family and didn't even tell them about this. There were more suspects though, which we will get into, but first with Fred, they uncovered that an argument had occurred that very morning before Inga even went to class, before she talked to this contractor about the tile and said to come back later, Fred and Inga were there in the apartment. Fred had spent the night and they had woken up that morning and had this little argument. And I'll explain that in a bit. Fred was from this wealthy farming family, just as Inga was. And he was said to be extremely smart as well. They went to the same college. He was one of the top students. And he had actually graduated and he was an actuary at Old Mutual after the graduation, which was a very good paying job. He was basically a business professional who analyzed the financial consequences of risk. And he then was asked to move out of the Lotz family home once the blame began to shift to him. These two families, the Lotz and the Vanderveyers, were basically going to war and investigators believed that Fred was evading them. Now we've heard that Jan actually had some ill feelings toward Fred that he never previously said, maybe just to make his daughter happy, but so did Juanita. Now Juanita came forward to say that the weekend prior to Inga's murder, she came back home as she always did. She was happily talking to her mother. She had gone swimming with her dog and Juanita said that she noticed that her daughter had a lot of bruises on her especially her arms. Now, she had noticed that something was a little bit off, but Inga kind of just brushed this off and she was saying, what are you talking about now, mom? But then she went, she changed into clothes that covered them. Fred had actually been asking Inga if he could come over and Inga said no, but Juanita said he came over anyway. And then when she was packing, she packed this short looking sundress. It was just a fun summer dress and Juanita remembers Fred saying that she was only to wear that dress when she was with him. 
And Inga actually laughed at this. Her and Marita laughed, thinking that he was joking, but Fred wasn't laughing. So when they got into the car to leave, Juanita told Fred to take care of Inga, that she was all they had. And in the car, Inga had allegedly told Fred that she was not going back to his place of worship, his church, which was actually different than the church that she and her family went to, that she had occasionally gone to, the same church that Marius went to as well, Marius and Christo. And it's unknown why she suddenly was saying she wasn't going. But more and more suspects were being found, including a possible witness to the murder. This was a man, or a teen, a 17-year-old named Werner Carolus, who had tried to talk to the police as well as different private investigators many different times, and he pointed out Inga's apartment and said that the murder happened there, but then he would always get too nervous to say anything else. When he did talk, though, he claimed that three of his friends, including a drug dealer named Jaco Swanepoel, were involved. Now, this is just what the public were told that this statement had come out and that later Warner had said he had seen a white man killing Inga, but he actually didn't know him. And then he said he wasn't going to point out a killer because this killer was vicious and he didn't want to end up in prison with him. Ultimately, he was deemed an unreliable witness because he was found to be a convicted burglar as well as a drug dealer himself. He couldn't keep his story straight, and when it came down to giving actual information, he always chickened out. So although they were worried that this man may have seen something, they did just kind of move on. But a man named Ian Myberg was spoken to as well. He was actually Inga's uncle, whom she was close to. Now, Ian had an alibi that he was actually 14 miles away the night of the murder in Pretoria with friends. And when he had heard what occurred, he actually flew to Inga's family to support them and be by their side. But the reason that he was suspected in the first place was because when he heard about all of this, he had printed an article to get information about the killer into this newspaper. But he put his private cell phone number instead of the police number that they had for tips. Investigators found this odd that, they, that he wouldn't give their number. Now that's not where the strangeness stopped because Werner, the man who had said he had witnessed a possible crime and that it possibly involved a drug dealer named Jaco, well, this Jaco had gone to investigators and said that Ian Myberg, Inga's uncle had come up to him and had asked if he knew him, if he had seen him before, and if he knew where Inga was murdered. Investigators thought this was very suspicious, that Uncle Ian could be trying to figure out if this man saw him killing his niece. However, like I said, Ian appeared to still have this alibi. Investigators actually asked Ian, why would you do this? And he said, it's not true. So then they said, well, why would Jaco lie about speaking to you? And Ian then said, well, actually there's a journalist in the area that looks a lot like me and maybe they were asking him questions. Again, there was no real conclusion other than the fact that they didn't have much to go on with Ian. And so the next possible suspect was Marius Botha, the man who originally led Christo to her body when nobody else had found her. It turned out that Marius was best friends with his roommate Fred and her boyfriend, but he might have been in love with his best friend's girlfriend. You see, Marius and Inga had actually become friends before this, before him and Fred, four years prior in college and he had fallen in love with her and had allegedly written a love letter to her and a poem. When Inga and Fred started dating, Marius allegedly told her that their relationship would never be the same because of this. And a few weeks prior to the murder, Marius had actually asked Fred if he and Inga were pure, if they had basically had sex because he had seen them under the duvet watching TV together. And Fred said that they were still virgins, they were still pure. Now this came about because they were very religious. Everybody in this community, or at least these group of friends, were said to be super, super religious and very pure themselves. A few days before the murder, not that morning, but a little while before, Marius 
had kissed Inga and Inga had told Fred. Now, Marius was questioned and he said that he did kiss Inga, but then he prayed to God for forgiveness for getting involved in their relationship. And it kind of was confirmed, these rumors and texts that was from Inga to Fred, where she said, hi, it was a friendly kiss, not a flirty one, just in case you think something else. However, Fred claimed that this was actually not about Marius or anybody in general. It was about a text she had sent prior where she put an X at the end of it, which means kiss. And so she was saying it was a friendly kiss and not a flirty one, which is strange because that is her boyfriend. But another text from Inga said, I told Rudy about you today. So it was pure friendship love. Now investigators found these and they began to see patterns of Inga over explaining herself and it appeared as though Fred may have been dealing with a bit of jealousy. So these best friends, Marius and Fred were looking equally as guilty, but this is when a letter was found from Inga to Fred and investigators believe that Fred was actually hiding this from them because Inga spoke of the fight that they had that morning of her murder and it was said to be a bad one. Now this letter said, Dear Fred, this letter is going to be a bit more difficult than email. Can't delete and make changes over and over. But I must get these little things off my chest this morning. I am sorry you left her this morning so confused. I was initially unreasonable and consequently the whole thing got out of control. Firstly, about you and your brothers, I pray that God will give you the wisdom on how to handle that situation and that you will be able to resolve the issues between you. Remember, I am always here if you want to talk and I very much want to be a part of your life and try to understand what you're going through. The little things that are bothering me at this moment, I'm really sorry about some of the things I said this morning. My biggest mistake over recent times must have been to find my security and solution to my low self-esteem in you instead of in God. I haven't realized it up until now, but God has unbelievable ways to speak to one and I now realize that I have been the unreasonable one and not you. Furthermore, I am extremely scared of the Easter weekend and that you will see my father when he has had too much to drink. I don't want to lose you in such a way and I don't want you to see that side of my family. It must sound silly, but it's really a big concern to me. And lastly, the, just the usual little things. Work, CT1, am I going to get a job? What am I going to do with my flat, etc., etc. It sounds silly when I write it down on paper, but it's only right that you know what is going on. I don't want to keep bothering you with the same issues. Sorry that I sometimes forget that you're only human. I look up to you so much and have so much great respect for you, your opinions, and the way you handle problems. I don't always realize that you also have bad days and get hurt sometimes. I don't always know how to support you, and even if you need or want support, I don't understand how you handle hurt. You will have to teach me how to understand you and how to support you. I feel that I disappoint you if I can't do the things I mentioned above and that you deserve to have a beautiful girlfriend who looks good, who can cook, and who is in all respects just as perfect as you are. I struggle sometimes to get there. Perhaps this is what is the most difficult for me. I know that you don't expect it from me, but then you must please show me how I can be the perfect girlfriend for you. I love you very much and I don't want to look any further. Tomorrow, it will be one year since I fell in love with you. The first Wednesday afternoon that you alone came over and had coffee with me. And since that day, I have not doubted for one moment that it is you that I want. You have enriched my life in so many ways and every day with you is the greatest gift that anyone could dream of. You need never doubt again for one moment that I am absolutely committed and that I want with everything within me to be with you forever. I want to promise today that I will not depend on you for good self-image and for security and that I will take it to God and that I will support you in everything that you do and that I will be absolutely honest with you about all aspects of my life. I can also promise you today that I will, with, great, with God's grace, always remain faithful and that, and she wrote, I will never cheat on you and then crossed it out and said, I will never do anything behind your back. I love you with all my heart and I have no doubt that I want to spend the rest of my life with you. Strength with everything at work. All my love, Inga. Now there is a lot to unpack in that letter, but I will let you come to your own conclusions about that. And please leave down below what you think, what you got out of that note. But Fred said that they saw each other that morning, they went to class, and then after class, Inga had given him this letter and 
He was actually going straight to work after that, which was around 31 miles away. And he would be there from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. that day during the time that they believed was her time of death. He said that they also didn't have plans to see each other the rest of the day, but that he couldn't get a hold of her. And so that's when he began to get worried. Now, this all was very suspicious that a fight had occurred, that Fred didn't disclose of this, that this letter was not disclosed of. And so that is when Detective Addie Trollope, with 35 years of experience, led this investigation against Fred. They zeroed in on Fred and they went with it. They found that between 3.29 and 5.14 that day, Fred actually wasn't online or on his phone, and the rest of the time at work, he was. And so through surveillance footage, they began looking. They found him when he came in at 11 and when he left at 6, but no other time did they see him leaving. However, it was theorized that maybe he had gone down to the basement where his car was in that, you know, garage, and that he had gone away that was not shown by security footage, and that nobody really noticed that he had left and came back. And so that is when they began to blame the murder of Inga Lotz on Fred. And about a month after Inga's murder, they found in Fred's car an ornamental hammer. And he said that it was a gift from Inga's parents the previous Christmas. But investigators believed that this could be the murder weapon. And it was said to be extremely scarce in South Africa to have this specific hammer. This is also when evidence began coming back. And they found on this DVD player of the Stepford Wives, there was a fingerprint. And it matched Fred. However, Inga had rented this DVD at 3 p.m. that day when Fred claimed that he had not been with her and was not going to see her the rest of the night. And around 3 p.m. when she rented this DVD and went home was around the time that Marius said that they couldn't get a hold of her. But this fingerprint on this DVD became known as Folian 1, and it became very controversial. But it also appeared as though Fred's shoes that were found in his apartment could match the bloody shoe print or the bloody marks on Inga's bathroom floor. These shoes were white and orange and black and they were called squash shoes and they appeared to be washed but on the bottom and the grooves were still blood droplets or what appeared to be. Fred then agreed to and passed a lie detector test but a month later on June 15th, Fred actually turned himself in after the police began looking for him to arrest him. However, this was not an admission of guilt. He and his family said they were going to fight this. So in February of 2007, the trial began and would last for the next nine months. It was huge in South African news. And at the trial, the defense immediately claimed that police were negligent and that the only reason that they were going after Fred is because they had basically not researched into anybody else. They didn't do any good police work, that they didn't cordon off the crime scene and dozens of officers were walking all around before the evidence was collected, that they had tunnel vision, and that Fred was their fall guy, Fred the boyfriend. They then brought in fingerprint experts who began to argue that one of the main pieces of evidence against Fred, the fingerprints on this DVD, were actually fabricated, and that it was actually fingerprints from a drinking glass that was in Inga's apartment that Fred could have used at any point while he was there, and they used it to frame him. The defense actually tried to get this evidence thrown out and were unsuccessful. However, the prosecution would willingly throw it out after having more experts look into it. Because expert Pat Wertherheim did testify, saying that he had done some experiments that had shown that this fingerprint was in fact from a drinking glass because it was curved and there was also a lip print that appeared to be next to it that was found. However, this expert was with Fred's father during the entire thing. The South African police knew that Fred had been in and out of the apartment, but they also knew that Inga had rented a movie to watch that afternoon after Fred had gone to work. For that reason, the DVD cover itself was probably the only item in the whole apartment from which his fingerprints would not be expected. So my first impression when I saw Foley in One is this, this lift did not come off of a DVD cover. 
So like I said, the prosecution was determined to get to the bottom of this, so they didn't look like fools. And they created a team from the SAPS Forensic Center to look into this with Superintendent Roger Dixon, part of it. And he ended up having his theory turned into the Dixon Report. And due to his opinion that it was from a drinking glass, that Fred's fingerprint could have been there just previously and it didn't mean he was a killer, the prosecution actually withdrew that evidence because they began to doubt it themselves. You see, Dixon said that he actually found that there were 11 glasses inside of Inga's apartment that day that were not taken in for evidence, meaning they were not in these sealed bags to preserve evidence. Only four were said to be brought in and Dixon did test the fingerprint and claimed that the curvature appeared to be the same as those glasses even though the DVD was flat. So that's when he came to his conclusion. But as far as the hammer found, the possible murder weapon, experts claimed that this hammer didn't actually match the wounds of Inga and that they used it in an experiment on a pig head where they attacked the pig head like Inga was, and they wanted to demonstrate if it could do the same thing. However, the hammer actually ended up bending when they did this. It also had no blood or Inga's DNA on it. When it came to the bloody footprint that was found that was possibly matching these shoes that Fred had, the defense claimed that the blood in the bathroom wasn't actually tread marks left from a shoe, that there was no blood or DNA on the actual shoes, and the defense then submitted seven statements from Fred's co-workers claiming that that day he never left, and that there was actually footage showing that he didn't and no investigators actually obtained, and that the whole day Fred was calm and normal and present. Now, Marius actually took the stand and he began to cry as he said that he and Fred were the ones to go and inform Juanita of what happened to her daughter. He said Fred was at work trying to get a hold of Inga that he couldn't. He was still at work, Marius lived far away and that's why he called Christo and that Fred was the reason he would even do so because he had asked Marius to make sure she was okay. Basically, while Marius was trying to get a hold of Christo to go to the apartment and to figure out what had happened, Fred had gone over to Juanita's place after work to get the gate remote for her apartment to get in to check on her. And so Fred was over there. Then he had called Marius to get an update, which Marius didn't want to tell him over the phone. So he said, can you go back to Juanita's home, the Lotz family home? And I wanna to talk to you there. So Fred allegedly went back to the home and they ended up speaking about it before going to tell Juanita. But before Fred was actually told, before Marius got there, Fred was actually found to have called his mother and said, mom, something is terribly wrong with Inga. Then in a bombshell statement from a police officer, they revealed that they had actually gotten a confession from the killer. This was Dion de Villers who said that a man had confessed to them that he had followed a young woman who regularly bought drugs from him to her apartment. He also mentioned a woman named Eleanor. This man was actually 17-year-old Werner Carolus the man that was the one who said he witnessed a crime before. But apparently that's not all he said. He had many different statements and apparently one of them was that he was the killer. And this wasn't all with that statement either because it turned out that when Werner had confessed, he had told them where the murder weapon was hiding in a certain street. And so they searched this area and they found a knife which I couldn't find whether this was the one that matched Inga's apartment or not, but they found a knife and a pair of scissors. Now, like I said, Werner had implicated this man named Jacko, who was a drug dealer. Now it was seeming as though the officer was saying, actually one of his statements was that Werner and Jacko were a team that they killed together. Now they searched Jacko's car and they found that the, he had a remote control mechanism and they wondered if this was used to get into the gated apartment complex. But like I said, there were a few hours when this gate wasn't even working. However, after speaking with the complex, it wasn't believed to be a match, wasn't believed that it would work on this gate. And then Werner told police, actually, I didn't kill Inga, but I did kill someone. 
However, nobody knows who that was. So this whole thing was yet another layer that nobody really knew whether to believe or not. And then Werner was admitting to lying about everything, all the statements he had ever made. But this was in court when this was being heard and the judge who was Dion Van Zyl asked why Werner would lie about something like that. But the officer said that he, Werner, wanted revenge on possibly Jacko, probably somebody else, who had assaulted him during a drug deal and then he was trying to frame them for murder. But the sergeant then came forward of this police department and said, all of that's true that that officer just said, and there was blood on this knife that we found as well. It was also a match to someone in their system who they did not specify and they searched that person's house, but nothing more was said to be connected to Inga because it was not revealed at trial. But the judge, heard all of this information, and then he acquitted Fred Vanderveyer. He said he was rejecting the evidence of the shoes, the hammer, the fingerprint, and that the court could do no more than what the evidence in front of them permits. That it appeared in the initial stages of the investigation, it was weak and ineffective. Just because it was weak and ineffective and the judge in an actual trial could not find this man guilty, did that mean he was innocent? Fred's family were ecstatic, of course. They said that their boy is completely innocent and his father had actually sold his million dollar farm to help pay for all of the lawyer fees. But the Van Dyer family said that the whole thing put tremendous strain on them and was emotionally draining. But Juanita and Jan Lotz, they did not accept this sentence. They actually filed a civil lawsuit in 2009 against Fred for damages of 8 million rands in South Africa, which is the equivalent to 463,000 US dollars. They said that everything the Vanderveyers had said, all the money that they had put in to this was just a propaganda campaign. But two years later in 2011, Fred decided to sue the state for wrongful arrest for 46 million rands. It's a significant amount more than what the victim's family was even asking for. This equaled 2,667,000 US dollars. During this lawsuit, Fred actually took the stand and he revealed a little bit more about that morning. He told the court that he had last seen Inga the morning of her death, that it was around 8.15. And Inga was actually very worried that Fred was upset with her because he was just said to be upset in general. Fred was telling her, you know, it's not her, it's actually my brother because we got in a fight, but it's not you, it doesn't have anything to do with you. Fred began to tell Inga that he did still love her, but he wanted to know why she continued to ask him and she thought that he didn't. He said Inga started to cry when they started talking about their relationship. So he was saying, you know, is something wrong? Are you still sure about this relationship? Fred claims that she wouldn't answer, but she said that she would write it all down and give it to him after their classes before Fred went to work. He finally admitted after the letter was found that this letter, you know, was given to him. He told the court that the police could have easily found evidence of him at work during that time, but they didn't check. That he also wasn't hiding the letter, but he just didn't give it to police. And that he was not evading police at all. In fact, he said he had an appointment with police for questioning and then they canceled and he tried to arrange another appointment after this. Now, a forensic footwear impression expert named Bill Bodzik spoke at the lawsuit that Fred shoes couldn't have made that mark on the bathroom floor. He said that during the investigation, he had told those investigators it was not possible, it was not a match, but they confirmed that it was from Fred's shoes. Now, Bill also then began to claim that investigators added another mark, a little mark onto the stain that they'd taken a picture of after testing to make it appear as though it fit better to Fred's shoes. Strangely enough, Bill also testified at OJ Simpson's trial and Inga's parents had started to say that her case and Fred's trial was a lot like O.J. Simpson's over in America. Now, regarding that extra little bit that was allegedly added on by police during the testing, now I did read that this extra element to the blood marks was found 15 days before they ever got Fred's shoes, meaning that they wouldn't have had the shoes to create the mark to better fit their narrative. And the reason some people believe 
that there was this new mark altogether was due to the way that they were testing it and that with digital filtering and low concentration, it appeared, but it had been there all along. Now, the minister of police heard of this lawsuit and that he and his colleagues were being attacked and he was given leave in order to appeal these claims for wrongful arrest and malicious prosecution but Fred won the lawsuit. However, it was overturned by the Supreme Court appeal, and then Fred took this to the Constitutional Court, which declined it. Now, Inga's parents believe that Fred got away with murder. So, in 2012, they offered 1 million rands to anybody who would solve the murder of their daughter. They even hired a private detective named Piet Bleiveld to keep investigating because now they had no suspects in their daughter's unsolved murder. They told the press that they believed the killer was one of five people and all five of those people were at their daughter's funeral. Jan ended up in the hospital for a while with PTSD and depression due to the stress of all of this. And this bloody towel from Inga's trial was said to go missing after that. It was supposedly held in the judge, Dion Van Zyl's chambers, but then it vanished. And then theories about the murder weapon began to emerge, saying that it wasn't actually a hammer at all, that maybe it was a semi-automatic handgun that was used to beat Inga over the head in many different ways, because there were different marks all over her body. But many of these theories practically all of them led back to one thing, either a police cover-up or police negligence that allowed a killer to never be caught. This is when the private detectives were really going to come in handy because they found so much more, or at least told the public so much more. And this was believed to be because investigators were so just narrow-minded when it came to an investigation that they found Fred and that's all they looked at, even if you know, they could have uncovered more things that would have further gotten Fred a sentence, found him guilty. They just wanted to take him to trial immediately. So in 2012, there was something called the Mallette investigation, and this attempted to bring charges against the experts who testified for the defense, claiming that ethics and professional conduct were violated. A man named Thomas Mallette was basically an amateur sleuth and he believed that the court was deceived by numerous witnesses saying that the fingerprint was from glass and that the hammer couldn't have been the murder weapon. Basically, they believed that Fred was guilty and got away with murder. So Thomas and his brother Calvin claimed to do experiments on their own with their own experts and they have said it's impossible that this fingerprint was from a drinking glass due to certain elements like condensation. However, their three petitions to, you know, bring charges against these witnesses were denied. They do have two books about their theories called Bloody Lies and Bloody Lies 2. However, the private detectives at this time claimed that the Mallets were committing fraud, that Basically, they needed to stop doing what they were doing, but that they weren't necessarily against the theory that Fred had gotten away with murder. You see, the private detectives had done their own digging. They began finding further evidence, and it wasn't necessarily all against Fred. You see, the one fingerprint on the DVD was the only one that was ever told to the public or believed to be located. However, these new investigators said that they found seven that should have already been tested by investigators before taking Fred to trial. That one fingerprint was actually found on a packet of sauce from a takeaway, you know, like a, a ketchup, a sauce packet. And this was bought the afternoon that Inga died around 3 p.m. And like I told you, Inga had lunch with a friend that day and this was just after 1 p.m. after her classes and giving Fred the letter. Inga and Wimpy Boshoff had lunch on campus together and they were very good friends, very close friends. And in fact, Inga got a text from Fred around this time saying he was glad that her lecture was fun and hoped she had a good time with W. Fred also mentioned reading this letter and this text as well. And this was before she went home to have her tile fixed and then went to the shopping center. But these private detectives weren't actually suspicious of Wimpy and I don't know why. They just seemed to rule him out pretty quickly, even the private ones. But they were suspicious of 
a cheeseburger because this is where the packet of sauce came from, not from the lunch date, or at least it wasn't believed it was from the lunch date with Wimpy. It was believed that it was when she went to the mall hours later and bought a cheeseburger that came with a sauce packet. Now, these detectives wondered why this very small girl would eat lunch at 1 p.m. and then go and buy a cheeseburger at 3. It was theorized that this could have been for somebody else she was meeting that nobody knew about. The cheeseburger was found in the trash, it was eaten, and the sauce packet fingerprint was never tested. They have since allegedly sent those seven fingerprints in for testing, and Wimpy did give them interesting information about that lunch date because he had claimed that he had spoken to Inga, who said that that morning she and Fred had a hell of a fight that she wasn't sure they would recover from. Now, a digital forensic scientist named Audrey Stander claimed to be working on this case with the private detectives, and he would uncover a group called the Wolverines, which was said to be a brotherhood who could have been involved in this murder. You see, they found emails between a group of 15 friends allegedly friends of Inga and Fred, but it was unknown if it included Fred and Inga. Now remember, before I tell you more about it, this group of friends were also to be devoted Christians with very strong beliefs and actions that followed that. However, they also did not believe in sexual acts before marriage or at all. In fact, Fred had actually refused to have much physical interaction with Inga because he didn't want it to escalate. But these emails found, and we don't know if it's between Inga and Fred, we don't know actual names that hasn't been released, but these emails all had a very sexual undertone between what appeared to be all men. And they would send these gay, nude, male images to one another. They had a newsletter for Wolverines and they signed off with a slogan saying HHS Who Home Scythe, which allegedly means keep it stiff. But what the digital forensic expert found was that these people might have known about Inga's death before her body was found. He said that one of these individuals were silent during the time of the murder and had no alibi. He also uncovered that five days prior to the murder, an email went out that said, I have to say it was an honor when they invited me to become part of this exclusive little group of wolves. I'm still trying to figure out where the name comes from, but after more than four years with most of you, I learned not to ask questions. I'm just going with the flow, wherever it goes. So it appeared as though there was an initiation of another member at this point, and it seemed like this was very important for the private investigators to tell people. To me, it leaves you with more questions. And after Inga's murder was revealed, the group was said to speak about Inga saying that they would never forget her smile. So they obviously knew her closely. And there was allegedly a letter written by Inga where she talked about the Wolverines and it was said to be written to Fred where she was saying that the Brotherhood told her not to be involved with him, but she's glad she didn't listen because she liked him. The investigators took this. They have come to the conclusion from what they have seen and maybe not told us everything, that a member of the Wolverines was actually in love with Fred and they might have killed Inga to silence her. Now this is all allegedly because we haven't seen any actual proof from the private detectives, only what they have said they have found. But there was also an article that came out around this time saying that the murder scene when Inga was being found, her friend named Sorette Vander Heever was lying at her feet when her body was found. And she said that afterwards she stopped talking to one of Inga's close male friends. She ended up denying what this article said, and it was very random that they would just publish this out of nowhere. There were also rumors that Investigators were looking for two women, or they should have been. They were Kosha-speaking white women who were dressed as goths around 19 to 21, possibly students, who showed up at the crime scene to ask if Inga was okay, but no one knew who they were or ever saw them again. These private detectives said that they're looking into these whole group of friends, possibly the Wolverines, possibly just everybody around Inga even closer, not just honing in on Fred, but they also were going to be looking closer at the relative of Inga, which I'm assuming is Uncle Ian. There were rumors that started coming out that 
Inga was pregnant and planning an abortion, but was murdered by her own relative before she could. And another rumor claimed that Inga wasn't actually Jan's daughter, but one of Juanita's family members' daughters, which is why she was killed. Inga's parents have denied all of this. In fact, they said that it's absolutely just heartbreaking that these rumors are even coming out. But by June of 2013, Inga's father, Jan, stopped using the private detective altogether, and it's unknown why. However, just five months later, he began asking for the case to be reopened against Fred. And he said, people tell me I should close the book and get on with my life, but how can I close a book I don't understand? And this was actually said to be fueled even more when a professor named Cobus Visser created a report saying that Fred's fingerprints were taken from a flat surface, meaning it could have been from that DVD, meaning he could be a killer. But Jan was then told they were not reopening the case. Juanita and Jan have said that their daughter has died twice once when she was murdered and another when the nasty rumors were being spread about her and her family. They have said that the people close to who they believe Inga's murderer is are hellbent on ruining their good name. That by now, they should be grandparents. They should be retired not fighting for justice. In 2015, Fred actually was on TV again, but not as the face of a killer. He was a financial expert giving out retirement advice. He was living a normal life. He had gotten married four years prior, which was four years after the trial, to an occupational therapist, and they're now living in Cape Town, and they are a part of many church projects. And we cannot cover this case without at least mentioning the atrocious amounts of violence against women in South Africa. They are constantly fighting for justice over there, and I will leave a few cases that I have covered down below if you would like to learn more about that, but it truly is a horrific time. But do you believe Fred was innocent? Could it have been Marius who was allegedly in love with Inga? Did it have something to do with a strange brotherhood among the friends? Who was really involved in that brotherhood and why? What was the purpose? If they, if the Brotherhood was innocent in this, it's almost heartbreaking to me that they felt the need to have the secret group to be themselves or to be maybe the gay men or the bisexual men that they were because they felt like they had to hide it from their religion. And all I have to say about that is if your religion isn't allowing you to be yourself, that is not a healthy environment to be in. And no matter what you believe is the greater power, the greater power would not want you to be suffering being yourself. But why is this even a thing? Why do they have a code name of Wolverines? Is it just people having fun being students or is there something more sinister going on here? Could it have been the construction workers or the contractors who saw Inga who knew she was alone in this apartment? Or someone who just noticed the gates were down and took that as an opportunity? Was it Warner and his drug dealer friends who confessed? Why would he confess if he knew nothing? What would he get out of it confessing or if he really was just maybe on drugs and out of his mind? But how about Inga's uncle, Ian? Why were investigators looking at him at all? They obviously saw something very suspicious. And why was Ian so interested in knowing what Jacko knew, what he had seen? There is so much in this case. And you know, you have to take things with a grain of salt because a lot of these things are just theories or just things we don't have concrete proof of. And so at that point, how do you solve a case? You know, I think that private investigators are trying their hardest and I think that it's going to be a very difficult journey to try to undo all of the negligence and wrongdoings that the police kind of set the stage with when they began the investigation. And poor Inga just deserves justice. She was in her own apartment when she was attacked and it's thought to be by someone she knew. She trusted this person. So why? Why did they do this? Was it to cover up their own feelings towards her, their own feelings towards Fred? Nothing to me seems certain. Please let me know what you think because I feel like I'm going crazy on this one. Inga deserves justice and I think all of this is just crowding her beautiful soul. There's no need for it to have gone on for so long. Someone needs to just speak up and say that they know what happened because I don't think it's just one person who knows. I think it's many and I think they're staying silent to keep someone safe. Please let me know all of your thoughts what you believe happened, who you believe could be the most likely suspect. Don't forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay, bye.